Good evening, hockey fans, and welcome to episode number three of Pod Snipe Selly. Bit of a new look this week. Uh, we got the new intro, new background, new fonts, uh, all of it looking great so far. My name is Dan Bradley. If you're just joining us, welcome to the show. We thank you for joining us on this wonderful Tuesday night. Uh, alongside me is Joel Fernino. Joel, how are you doing tonight? Um, yeah, I'm, 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 you know, okay. Uh, things aside, I am doing quite well. Thank you for asking, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in to episode three. It's going to continue to get more surreal as those numbers crawl up. <laughs> it is. And we uh, got we, an interesting one for you. We had a very lighthearted show planned for today's episode um and then we got some news out of chicago and that's kind of had to redirect the course of where we wanted today's podcast episode to go um for those who have not been following the news of of what happened um today um the firm of jenner and block completed their investigation into the blackhawks organization uh, regarding an alleged cover-up of sexual assault of one of their uh, former players. Um, and with the conclusion of their findings today and the publishing of their report, um, we find out that uh, Stan Bowman is out as Chicago Blackhawks general manager. Um, this happened during his first season. Um, he is out as... Blackhawks general manager. He's out as the general manager of USA Hockey, um, where he had been charged with constructing the Olympic hockey team. And first and foremost, Joel, I just want to get from you right off the bat, your reactions to this, because you are a Chicago Blackhawks fan. That's that's your team. You've, you've literally got the uh, the logo tattooed you know, on you. So th- this is personal for you. It's, it's a weird day. How are you as a Blackhawks fan reacting to the news today. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, obviously we, we know me as kind of the comedic relief, but to start off on a serious note, it is an embarrassing and sad day to be a Blackhawks fan. Um, there's no easy way, you know, it's, you know, the, the news today, we knew something was coming at some point here. Um, it was both, embarrassing sad infuriating and i think most importantly just completely avoidable in my opinion um as a fan um from my perspective and i mean i think you know we'll get into this um you know the fans as affected as we are you know we're not the important ones here you know the 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 victims Mm -hmm. are the most important here um But uh, I will touch on how I'm doing or, you know, from the fans perspective. But um, I think we would be remiss without prefacing the start of this episode with since, I mean, this is pretty much going to take up a good chunk of our time. A lot of the show. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So I think I would be remiss if I didn't start it off by, you know, for whoever is watching live. Thank you for tuning in for whoever watches the recording. Thank you for watching the recording or listening to it on Spotify. Um this today's news today's investigation results everything that we're going to unpack today is not just tethered to the blackhawks it's not just tethered to the nhl it's not just tethered to sports you know it's a it's a very widespread unfortunate issue um you know that obviously today you know in today's society like people are coming forward more now um than in the past and it's 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 a sad truth um that this stuff is happening has happened is happening across the organizations of of every you know of every stature sports organizations companies schools you know you name it um and I think it, you know we'll we'll touch on this more. And everything we say today is obviously going to be from the hockey perspective. But I'd be remiss without saying, you know, at its core, hockey is a game. I, I get it; it is a lifestyle for hardcore fans that have hobbies and other things like you and I, and like the fan bases of all of our of our teams. It's a lifestyle for the players. It's a career um, for the players and staff. But at its core, it is a game. And with that game between the players, staff, those those players, those staff are human beings. They're not 
spokes in the wheel, even though we'll unpack some execs seem to think they are. They're not spokes in the wheel. They're not just assets. They are human beings and they have feelings. Um, and they, you know, they, they mean something, you know, they have aspirations, they have dreams, career goals. And it's just unfortunate to see just more of this happening, you know, and it's, it's just another file in the file cabinet of, you know, I'm glad it was brought light and, you know, there's going to, you know, people are going to see the justice they deserve, but it, it's, it's, it's a very overarching theme and it, you know, it, it spurs much further than just sports. I think you're completely right on this. And and I feel like as we watched the results unfold today on Twitter, watching through the press conference, watching immediate reactions, watching how the news broke and was reported, I feel like something that you said was really poignant there, that the human element in all of this, at, at the end of the day, this all happened because a human being was hurt. Exactly. They were they were a hockey player, they were a member of the Blackhawks organization, but they were a person first. And I think in all aspects of how we try and respond to this and react to this and cover it, it's so important to keep the human element of what happened in Chicago in mind. Um, people's lives are permanently going to be changed because of all of this. Um, it's not a, a fair situation in what happened, but I think today's efforts are a push to move things towards some sort of a fair resolution. Obviously, I, I don't know what fair is and what fair looks like. You don't know. We can speculate what we think. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's only going to be as fair as it is in the eyes of the player involved. I, I think that's kind of the the long and short of the matter. Um, we'll, we'll look at this from a couple of different angles throughout the show tonight. Um, but I want to start with kind of what this means for the ripple effect throughout the organization. Um, we have general manager out president of hockey operations out uh, all sorts of top to bottom, just clearing house to the point where I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, that the only people who are still with the team from that time would be the owners, the Wurtzes, <coughs> Jonathan Taves and Patrick Kane. Other than that, is that everybody that's, um, is that everybody that's still with within the Hawks organization who was there in 2010 when all of this went down? Yeah, that's correct. It's, you know, from a player's perspective, it's, it's just Kane and Taves. And then from, you know, the exec perspective, it is just Rocky Wirtz. And the, the correction there too is Danny Wirtz, who has kind of taken, you know, a spearhead here of, oh my goodness. Oh, we got a, we got a big I'll, comment I'll, from I'll my buddy, Joe. We will get into this. Comment Joey, Joey, we will. Yeah, was, we will. That was a bigger comment that. than I thought it was going to be. So Joel, you, you go ahead here. And then we'll I'm, I'm happy he up. tuned in. He's got some great takes. He talks to me all the time. I want to, I want to feature him. He's got some great, great, great commentary, but um, we'll Sorry get to that. that. So, oh no, we'll get to that. Um, Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So Danny Wirtz has uh, taken a bit of a kind of a more, driver's seat to um you know the owner's chair um he's kind of the ceo now rocky is kind of taking a little bit of a back seat as of uh i think it was i want to say sometime in june of 2020 um that's when danny took his position and that's why you saw him talking in the debriefing today and rocky was just kind of you know backing him so um for all intents and purposes danny is was not involved in this whatsoever i think he was only in high school back then or college so yeah rocky um of course the owner rocky words and then yeah just Taves and kane and uh Taves and kane were actually both added to uh covid 19 protocol today so they're actually they're away from the team today which i i don't know it's it's unfortunate timing because i i wouldn't want to necessarily be with the team at the time that all of this is going down when you're the the leaders that Kane and Taves are but I also don't think you'd want to be away from the team either it's it's kind of a weird 
position for them to be in. Um, there, there, there are some who will say that, oh, it's to try and shelter Kane and Taves from having to answer questions about this. I, I don't think that's the case. I think at some point, Kane and Taves are going to have to answer questions about this in a post-game presser and a day off press, some way, somewhere down the line. That's going to happen. So yeah. I, I think, you know, especially yeah, yeah, when it comes to something health, I don't want to say, oh, this player's faking it or whatever. You know, unless it's really, you know, if if a Vikings corner gets burned for a touchdown and then comes up pulling his hammy and he's back in three plays later, I'm going to say, yeah, he was dogging it. But that's, no, that's I, a different, I, different situation. Yeah. And I think, too, to add to that, like they, they will, and you know, they have to answer some questions inevitably and they will. You know, Jonathan Taves is that kind of captain. He's going to, you know, he's going to say his piece and he is going to address it internally. Obviously there's going to be stuff. He talks to the room internally. I mean, you even saw, you saw the coach hand off the uh, dry erase board in the game the other day against uh, the Red Wings. So it's like, look, he, you know, the players have much more of a voice right now than I think they ever have. Right. You know, at this current moment with the the situation they're in of, uh, you know, the losing streak to start the season, but you know, Kane and Taves will, will definitely answer their questions. And I mean, you know, I think it, brings us to the reality too of like we are still living in a pandemic you know regardless mm-hmm. of what happens here good good bad this type of investigation uh, a party like whatever mm-hmm. it is we are in a pandemic and the timing is always going to be weird but you always want to keep player and personnel safety in mind first and foremost when it comes to covid and you know kane's been on the covid list for few days now and now Taves just got added to it along with you know and it was along with you know uh Borgstrom as well so it's it's not mm-hmm. just them like they're getting ravaged by COVID and right. it's not even just the Blackhawks the Bears are getting ravaged by COVID right now too mm-hmm. so it's just well, I guess it's Chicago um all right I'm gonna try yeah. and get Joey's comment back up yeah, here and I'm, I'm gonna do something <clears throat> just to see if this works and how this looks no that that wasn't what I had in mind that either we'll we'll just go back to like this all right so uh for those who are listening and not not watching here joey's comment says the hawks did the right things 10 years late makes me sick that this went on as a diehard blackhawks fan i praised their rebuild and cup run the organization was the best i had seen in my entire life and the mantra one goal really was that which is disheartening one goal no matter what comes up i would gladly trade that cup win for opening this case up way back when I think that's a really uh, a great point from from Joey there and and being able to look and say hey the the organization royally screwed this up at at just about every juncture that something could have gotten worse it got worse. Uh the report today just sickening as as you read through the pages and and infuriating um you find out that uh Brad Aldrich who uh, is is currently in prison for a different sexual assault. Uh, that was of a, a high school hockey player in Michigan. Um, after the first report of the assault to the Blackhawks, to their brass, to everybody that we heard was in that meeting today, um, after the Hawks had won the Stanley Cup, Aldrich had assaulted a 22-year-old intern with the team. Yep. Um, so we get we get reports of that. We get reports of the recommendations of Aldrich for um, t- for for other positions and personnel files missing from HR. They're, they're, this is just such an organizational failure. Failure. There, there's really no other word for it. Um, yep. And I, I think to that point. Hawks fans saying, you know, yeah, we we would trade that cup for making sure that this didn't happen. Uh, absolutely, without a doubt, I, I think I, that has to be the the take. Yeah, I mean, I I would resonate that as well. I would definitely trade that away to make sure that this is handled correctly. Um, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, hockey is just a game, and at this point, the the executives involved, and we're going to get to that part of the story as well. <clears throat> they ultimately decided to take PR and a game over a, a humans, you know, the human element here. Um, 
And I think, you know, Joey hit it on the head too. Um, you know, it, it's, it's sickening. Um, there's, you know, this report is about 107 pages. I've been able to read through at a busy day. I was able to read through a good, like, 10 15 pages of you know what uh what was most relevant at least just to a fan and not an easy read either that's no that, it's that's a heavy heavy read it's you know it, it 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 ranges from disgusting to infuriating and everything in between um and just baffling um you know the executives that were in that room i i think need to be highlighted the most here um, obviously outside of, of Aldrich, but right. well, he's, uh, yep. you know, he's, he's, he's the, the lowest for all of these. Yes. He is. And he is the lowest form of scum there can be. And, you know, he should be treated as such, but that goes without saying. Um, but I don't think we can stress it enough. The executives, however, <clears throat> that were in that meeting that was reported to have happened on actually an hour after the Blackhawks had just clinched the Western conference final against uh, the San Jose Sharks. Um, it was reported that, you know, after, um, John Doe player, um, had finally started to talk about what had happened. Um, we're Mm -hmm. obviously not going to get into the details of what exactly happened. You know, Mm -hmm. you can, you can go read the report. It's out there. It's public for everyone to read, but Mm -hmm. you know, the rumbling started to happen. He started telling who he needed to tell, um, and he find, you know, he had the courage to finally say something. And this meeting was held with, at the time, <clears throat> President John McDonough, new, new first year general manager Stan Bowman, Al McIsaac was in there, um, Kevin Shevel Dayoff was in that room. Um, who's the other one? Coach I'm Q. No, no, no. Hold on, I'm getting to that. Okay. But there was one okay. other. Uh, I can't remember his name. There, right there are a couple other people in there. Let me let me try and find it here. But uh, carry yeah, on. Yeah, here. yeah. So there is also a man. Uh, they just they only named him as Gary. Um, I think he was basically like the. I don't want to say the HR individual, but you know that representative in the organization, um, who basically all but told all the executives in that room, like you need to take this to the police. Jim Gary um, was Jim one of Gary. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you, Jim Gary. And then there was one other executive and i can't remember his name right now but um they were having this meeting talking about what they had heard right and i don't know what details they had but they were talking about everything they had heard and then literally since the game had just ended an hour prior an hour um prior to this meeting they then called for joel quinville to come up to the room but you know in the report it states that he needed you know the coach should know about this. This is his coaching staff. Get him up here now. And I think Quenville was even quoted as saying like, it was very unusual to get called up to a meeting, you know, an hour after a game, let alone a Western conference final clinching game. <clears throat> so, you know, then when he went up there and then it was also stated in the report that uh, exactly Stan Bowman and Joel Quenville both had stressed, you know, like we need to, you know, the, the, the hardships of how it was getting to the Stanley cup final. And, you know, we need to focus on the team first and then address this later. And then by the end of it, uh, John McDonough had been reportedly or had reportedly said that, you know, he will handle it. And then everything else explodes from there. That room has left one of the biggest stains Obviously, we know what Aldrich did, Mm -hmm. but that room with how they handled it has left one of the biggest stains on not just the Chicago Blackhawks franchise, but Chicago sports. I I would take that one step further and say even the NHL and professional sports as we know it. Yeah, there there were some reports um, that I I didn't see any. I I haven't gotten that far into the um, the report itself, but there are now some reports that. a representative at the time of the NHLPA didn't do anything uh, about it either. Don, Don Fair, the yes. head, yes, yes. Uh, who um, Fair, who is largely responsible for lockouts uh, oh. and the and the disputes between players and owners. Um, mm-hmm. Much of that comes down to Gary Bettman and Don Fair. Um, so that the the next point, I guess as we look at the ripple effect that this has throughout the league is what does this mean for those other personnel? What does it mean for Don fair? What does it mean for Gary Bettman? Does he need to 
um, make amends for this happening on his watch. And that's where I want to go next is in specific regards to uh, Joel Quenville, who is now the head coach of the Florida Panthers, Kevin Sheveldayoff, who is now the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets. What, if anything, should be the consequences for Quenville and for Sheveldayoff? I mean, I think it's probably a pretty simple um, consequence there. I, I think, you know, and coming from a fan's perspective, you know, Joel Quenville is a living legend here. You know, we were putting him on the Chicago coach Mount Rushmore with Ditka with, um, wow, that name just <laughs> uh, Phil Jackson, Chicago. Phil Bulls. Jackson, thank you. Wow, I, I, I knew where you were my, going with that. I hope none of my Bulls fans are going to yeah, my Bulls fans. Oh, are you're going to get it, me. buddy. You're going to get ja- it. <laughs> you know, we we put him with up there with Phil Jackson. You know, Mike Ditka. Um, hell, in a way, Joe Madden. Right. Um, we were putting mm-hmm. him up there with all those names and Ozzy Gian. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think it really it, it's the harshest thing that needs to happen. Right. Like they were in the you know, they were in the room. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Quenville may have came in late. So who's to say he didn't get all the details he needed and he had other focuses. But I still think that, you know, if we're going to change how the these things get handled and if we're going to really truly put the hammer down on scenarios that pop up like this, you got to fire both of them. The Florida Panthers and the Winnipeg Mm -hmm. Jets have to relieve them of their duties. I I probably ASAP. Um, I know Gary Bettman has released a statement that he is going to have personal one-on-one meetings with both of them on separate, you know, separate calls Mm -hmm. and review this. And, you know, I saw today that uh, the Florida Panthers declined to say anything about it um all they did was release that yeah yeah of course understand they, they gotta wait until they wade through all the they to get the, the report and yep yeah um so i mean i yeah I, I think it's plain and simple they they should be relieved of their duties and you know what happens after that i, I think branches off of you know our knowledge of the legal system and all that like we we don't really know so, so we got Joey with another comment. I like it. Uh, I got you this time, Joey. So from Joey, you know, we saw it with Bowman and the hockey ops here. All parties involved need to be fired. Makes you wonder if this is why the Hawks parted w- with McDonough and Q. So that is a good point, And I'm glad you touch on that, Joey. Um, I've been reading into a lot of that as well. You know, there's a lot of speculation. Like, is there a reason they parted with John McDonough? Is that the reason they parted with Q? I actually lean on the side of no, that's not why they parted with both of them. Um, <clears throat> as we know, and I'm not going to, this, this is a, we'll save this for a two minutes for roughing down the road <laughs> for me. But, uh, you know, as we know, Stan Bowman did not see eye to eye with Joel Quinville in the later years of his tenure. Um, and I think it was, you know, the same can be said with John, you know, John McDonough, but with Q, you know, he was ultimately fired because, and I still believe this, that, you know, Bowman wanted his yes man and Quinville was not his yes man. He fired him. So I don't think Q's firing had absolutely anything to do with this. Um, maybe, maybe more comes out and that's not the case, but I don't think that was the case um, at all personally. And then with John McDonough, I actually read into this earlier today that, um, and again, of course, people are going to speculate the same thing because John McDonough was just relieved of his duties, I believe, what, two years ago now? Um, with John McDonough, he actually more so was relieved of his duties um, by Rocky, actually, and Danny, at the, and I think Danny when he got his job, but by Rocky because when COVID hit, he basically was not in the right headspace to figure out how to handle you know, the comeback from the blow that all the COVID shutdowns caused. Um, and he had not come back with a plan. I don't, I don't even know if he came back with a plan at all, but he came, you know, whatever plan he came back with Rocky, Rocky Wirtz was just not seeing eye to eye with that plan to come back from the blow that COVID caused. So that ultimately led to, you know, them relieving John McDonough of his duties. And then of course, as soon as John McDonough got relieved of his duties, Danny, the son of Rocky was then uh, promoted right into his position. So I want to ask you this. I'm, I'm looking at a poll here on Twitter um, <clears throat> from an account that is very much worth a follow, at JFreshHockey. Um, does all sort of stuff with hockey analytics, um, 
charts, breakdowns, player cards, all this kind of stuff. It's it's just incredible stuff that he puts together. Um, he's got a poll on his Twitter right now um, with the question of what will happen to Joel Quenville. Uh, poll has just under 6,000 votes. It's at uh, 5895 okay. and counting. Um, okay. What will happen to Quenville? And the options are steps down, fired by Panthers, suspended by the NHL, or nothing. And 51.5% of the people responding to this poll say nothing. Wow. I think that speaks volumes about how hockey fans are perceiving this as to how the perception of the league is that they don't take discipline seriously. The other thing that we haven't even mentioned yet um, is that in addition to all of these firings is that the, uh, the league has fined to the Chicago Blackhawks $2 million um, as a result of this. And it was brought up earlier today that uh, that's less than what they find the New Jersey devils for yeah. signing Ilya Kovalchuk's contract. Yep. Um, that's less than the uh, salary cap recapture penalty for Vancouver on the Roberto Luongo contract. Um, what what is the takeaway here? Is is that the league has been soft in the past? Is there a time where they're going to get tough on all of this? I mean, it, it really. As a fan, I'm having a hard time making sense of what where the league goes from here i mean if if more than half the the fans and obviously this is, doesn't account for all hockey fans but a, a poll of six thousand hockey fans and more than 50 percent agree on something that's unheard of uh, in, in hockey but that you would have more than 51 percent of fans on that four answer poll saying that they don't think the nhl is going to or, or that the panthers specifically are going to do anything here um in either regard i think it speaks volumes about where the league is at in preventing these sorts of situations from happening again no i completely agree and i mean obviously i think we've seen over the years regardless of what the issue is you know we've had the you know, we've had the racial slur issues of fans and such, or of coaches too. You know, we've had the bullying things of, you know, whether it's coaches, players, um, mm-hmm. you know, we've seen like the, the re, you know, the ramifications of all these actions across the entire spectrum of what we consider, you know, what we know to be horrible. It, there's no consistency to it. Um, you know, contractual based stuff with, you know, Ilya Kovalchuk, it's like, it's it's a tough comparison. It's you know it's not exactly. Even, it's not even apples to oranges. It's apples to lunch Steak. boxes, <laughs> steak, whatever you yeah, want to. Literally, it's not, they're not the same. And I I understand the sentiment of not being the case. I I don't know when you look at it in that vacuum of the the three thousand or excuse me three million fine for the Devils and two million for the Blackhawks here. In that context, it just doesn't seem right. No, and I agree. But I will offer a bit of a alternate perspective. My mind yeah. thought about this when I saw, you know, the comparison of the two million versus that three million recently, um, and only you know two million dollars to an organization that's worth north of you know a billion. Yes, billion. They're in the billions of dollars as a franchise. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's like you and me paying a parking ticket. Um, but anyway, um, I think the all, you know, not the alternate, but the, the one perspective I did think about this is that the NHL did have to step in and find the organization and the organization at its core, it's, it is a name at this point in time in 2021. Rocky Wirtz as the owner, of course, you need to, well, and obviously Danny Wirtz now kind of taking the front seat. Whether they, you know, they didn't know, and I do truly believe they didn't know. However, they are the owners of this organization. You know, they are the Mark Zuckerberg of the Blackhawks, right? Like they are the owners and CEOs of this company. You know, all these, mm-hmm. all these sports teams, they are at, at their core, they are a company just like Facebook, Google, Amazon, 
Mm. You name it, right? They are a company. And I think they, as the owners, did the right thing with who they fired. You know, they came flat out and said, look, anybody, we're not going to name every single name, but everybody who was with the team in 2010 that still remains here in 2021 is gone and will never be back. That's step one. It's kind of an expected step, right? Mm. You need to do that. When, when you say won't be back, do you mean within the Blackhawks organization or do you mean within the NHL? Because Gary Bettman has left the door open for oh. that and says oh, and yeah. said that anyone involved, um, <laughs> he'll have the ultimate authority on that to decide whether or not they're allowed back in. But I think in saying that, he hasn't totally closed the door on this and, and come down hard. Oh, I agree. And that's, we'll, we'll get to that when it comes to the Blackhawks though. No, okay. will never be okay. no, yep. yeah, we, that's, that is a, that is a huge, I'm glad you said that. Cause I wanted to touch on that. So. All right. But, but yeah. Blackhawks specifically, your, your point. Yeah. So Blackhawks specifically. So they, that was step one. And I will, you know, I think we all know here, like, like you mentioned, I, I diehard fan through and through my, my buddy, mm-hmm. Joey here, who's watching the show, diehard fan through and through, we will bleed Blackhawks until the day we die. And that's not going to change from this unfortunate and, you know, just embarrassing situation. However, they are going to have to do a lot of cleaning up. There isn't just step one, two, three, done. There is step one, two, three, A, B, C, all the way to Z, all the way to 100. They have to do so much to clean this up. But step one was firing the remainder of the trash we're here and I'm going to use the word trash very vocally. <clears throat> so from that perspective that I'm getting to here is that they find the Blackhawks organization, but ultimately everyone there, there's no one left that, you know, there's no one left there that was directly responsible for this to that, you know, that really truly gets punished by a fine. Right. You know, mm. the league can find it, it hurts the owners of the team. Cause exactly. Because it, it's and their they, team and it happened on their watch. But exactly. And they should still have consequences as well. Even. And again, like I said, I believe them when they say they were never told it was kept from them. But it is still their team. They have to face the repercussions because stuff like this stuff as extreme as this starts at the top. So you mm. have to be punished in some way. And I think the league Maybe it was a PR stunt too, right? Like they're like, well, there's nobody left there to punish really that directly caused this or covered this up, but we still have to lay down a hammer. Even if it's a styrofoam hammer, we still got to do something Mm -hmm. to, you know, say like, look, this happened under your nose. You didn't see it. You didn't turn the wrong way or anything, but you didn't see it. So that's kind of Mm -hmm. my other perspective where it's like, they're punishing them, but they're really, they're, they're punishing the organization that has no one left that's involved anymore. So I'm wondering if that's why you didn't see a, maybe a higher penalty, like in the tens of millions, right. Or you didn't see like a a forfeit, a draft picks or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you, you know, this may have not been your fault directly, but now you have to live with the consequences and you have a lot of work to fix that. Mm-hmm. and gain the trust back of the fan base, gain the trust back of the league, and gain the trust back of, most importantly, your current and future players and current and future staff. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, so I think that's, I think that's you know, the, is that the perspective that I think is gospel? No, it's just, uh, it was a thought that popped into my head where I was like, I, you know, there's no one left to punish that harshly. Right. So they, I think the league just had to do something. I agree. And I, I think I haven't seen, I, I, I got the notification that the league was finding the Hawks 2 million. Mm-hmm. What I haven't seen yet is where is that 2 million going? Is that going to the player assistance fund, which is normally um, when you see big organizational fines, that's generally where it goes is, is a player's assistance fund. Um, yep. so that it goes to uh, help players who maybe were injured while playing the game and it mm-hmm. ended their careers. Um, the families, for example, of, um, you know, in, in those types of situations. Um, what I would love to see 
is this going to a um, maybe some sort of sexual assault survivors legal fund, something where there is a proactive benefit here. And maybe, maybe the Hawks take it upon themselves to say, okay, we're going to pay this $2 million fine to the league. That goes to the players fund. But in addition to that, this is what we are going to do. We are going to donate $2 million to sexual assault survivors assistance funding and legal funding to help out in that regard. I would like to see something like that. And as you touched on a minute ago, it's, it's not a be all end all. They, they pay that money and all this goes away, Mm -hmm. but that's a gesture that would show me that, Hey, we are serious about making this change. We are serious about our response to this organizationally. And this is one step that we are going to take to show you that we're serious about it and regain that trust. So I'm actually glad you mentioned that because they actually did do something like that. Oh, we got we got comment from Joey here. Yeah, one yes, one million you. one million of the two million is going to fund local organizations around Chicago that provide support and assistance to survivors of sexual abuse. Joey, thank you again yes. for Joey. You've been a rock star as a Joey. As a you just took the words right out of my mouth, out. man. <laughs> <laughs> Joey, yes. we, we appreciate you. And yeah. we, we appreciate those of you who are watching as well and, and listening to this as well. Um, we know you know, we're, we're very, it's a heavy episode and it's, we're, we're a viewer driven show. That's, that's what we want to be is talking about the things that our audience cares about. Um, I think we've kind of touched on everything that we, we need to touch on here. So with these, we, we got about 20 ish minutes left to the show. We're going to kind of segue into, um, and this is the hardest type of segue to, to have to make is out of something like this, but right. we're, we're going to do it. We'll, we'll go five seconds, just dead air. We'll let it breathe. And then we'll go on to the next bit. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on it towards the end again. And we'll, mm-hmm. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put a, we'll put a bow on it for now. And I'm sure there's going to be more to come. All right. So with that, let's move into this season and what is going on on the ice right now we've got all sorts of just bonkers scenarios around the league we've got the san jose sharks who are four and one we've got the the sabers who are four one and one i think yeah and then we've got teams that were supposed to be powerhouse clubs just in trouble the uh tampa bay lightning two three and one the toronto maple leafs two four and one which of those two teams is in more trouble? Joel, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. Who's in more trouble, Tampa Bay or Toronto? I think the easy choice for me is Toronto. And I think I'll get it out of the way. Tampa Bay has won two back-to-back Stanley Cups. You know, there's always going to be some sort of fall off. My opinion, there is some sort of hangover, right? And, you know, they lost their arguably their best player in Nikita Kucherov. But, you know, they got their two back-to-back Stanley Cups. Of course, they're in trouble because they're off to a horrible start and one that no one really expected because they pretty much brought back the same team virtually. But I think the Toronto Maple Leafs are in much more trouble here um, because I will argue to say that their fan base is much harsher on them than the Tampa Bay they're fan base. They're throwing jerseys on the ice in They're Toronto. throwing jerseys Five on the ice. Five into the season, they're throwing jerseys on the ice. And the thing is, is while Tampa Bay is, of course, continuing to be that perennial Stanley Cup, you know, one of the Stanley Cup favorites, Toronto in recent years, last maybe two years, and especially, especially coming into this year, were a Stanley Cup favorite to come out of the East. And they are not living up to it whatsoever. And especially when you have all that star power, what are you doing? You're, you're, again, they're young, but they're literally wasting this star power. And I think that they just, if you know, who's in, who's more in trouble? It, to me, it's got to be the Maple Leafs. They have much more to prove here than the Tampa Bay Lightning have. I'm going to respectfully disagree on this one. Oh, I think let's go. That, that Tampa Bay <laughs> is in more trouble here. And, and here's why. For one, they're not even the best team in their own state anymore. The Florida Panthers undefeated. That's going to be tough to deal with when they're not even the best in their own state and yeah, the, the lightning have a bigger fan base, but it's, it's starting to even out a little bit now that the Panthers are competitive again. Um, Toronto, the biggest difference between Toronto and Tampa Bay right now is health. 
as a factor and and you know the uh <clears throat> the maple leafs are healthy and the lightning aren't uh one point i want to bring up here is goals allowed andre vasilevsky is one of the top goaltenders in the league if not the top goaltender in the league and especially with carrie price being out and look at what happened to montreal vasilevsky is so so good when he is on his game but he's played more games i believe than any other goaltender including regular season and playoffs over the last three years than anybody else that wear and tear starts to add up and it has an effect of more than just the one season that's why the hardest thing to do after winning a championship is to go win the next one the next year it's rare in hockey to see back-to-back champions we saw it in 2020 and 2021 with the lightning we saw it 2016 and 17 with the pittsburgh penguins but that's been it until you go back you know into the into the 90s i believe with the with the red wings winning back to back in the the late 90s was the last time yep. a team won back to back it it doesn't happen and the last three peat we saw would have been what the it's the 70s islanders right or it's the, the 80s, 80s, islanders, 80s, 80s, islanders, 80s islanders, yeah. islanders 80 to 83 yeah, my dad was a huge New York Islanders fan in that era. And Rightfully so. <laughs> that, was, that was a good, good Islanders team. Oh, yeah. But I, I think it's got to be Tampa Bay that's in more trouble here because beyond the, the wear and tear, it's it's future of the organization as well. This could have a lingering effect into next season because they're gassed right now. They're, they're not playing sound hockey. They lost quite a bit of talent. Um you know, Tyler Johnson was playing really well with Tampa Bay. He went to Chicago, hasn't quite found his footing there yet. Got his Yanni first goal Gord, the other night. Yanni Gord is off to Seattle in the, the expansion draft. Yep. Uh, they they lost David Savard to free agency. They're in a tough, tough spot. They're in a tough division, and they're going to have to battle with Toronto to get back to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I think there's more pressure on Toronto right now to be good, given the, the nature of the team. But the team that's in more trouble to me is Tampa Bay. I think it's funny too that I like that you talked about like they're going to have to battle each other to get back to the. Oh, we got a we got a comment from uh, HP. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. I wanted to quickly. I, I liked what you mentioned about you know they got, they're going to have to battle each other, and I'm looking at their records. You know, you got two three and one for Tampa, and then you got two four and one for Toronto, and they're both sitting at a minus 10 goal differential, both of them. Exactly. So it's kind of one of those things where every time they match up, at least early on now, it's going to be that, that something's got to give matchup, but from a whole, from, from a negative perspective, as opposed to a positive perspective of two juggernauts hitting each other. We can get to HP's comment now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So HP Toronto, because of lack of depth, Tampa is absolutely pumping the penguins right now. Looking like good old Tampa. It's yeah, it's three, nothing uh, Tampa Bay in that game. Tampa coming off a bad loss against the Buffalo Sabres who we asked that asked last week a little bit, are the Sabres legit? And I I said, no, I'm, I'm not sold on them yet, but they're starting to prove the haters wrong a little bit here. I mean, they got a chip on their shoulder, right? They lost their, you know, their captain is sitting out indefinitely, right? And I think of inevitably. No, their, their captain is playing. It's Eichel's not the captain anymore. Oh, that's right. They stripped him. That's right. Mm-hmm. Well, their old captain is sitting mm-hmm. out and their best player is sitting out right now. And, you know, we'll we'll see where that goes. But I, I agree with HP. And I think it's, it's a good thing, you know, to your point, too. You know, depth and health. I mean, health is probably the biggest thing. Why Tampa is, sure, in trouble. But health comes back. They can get their wheels back as well. You know, they might be gassed, but as the season drags on, they can get their legs back under them and they can get back into it. Also, not to go back to the heavy part of the episode, but what happens with the fallout of, you know, this whole thing with Joel Quenville, that could really shake things up that, for the that first place. Florida really Panthers. Mess up Florida. Yeah, that, exactly. that's a good point, too. You get a coaching change midseason when you're on a tear. That is not good for anybody. No, um, not just syst- systems, but, you know, a voice in the locker room, too. Um, mm-hmm. Now, nah, that's not to say I still think Florida is the real deal. And I think they're going to continue. I, I agree with you. They're going to be they're going to be right in that conversation this year for sure. But you you rip a coach out from underneath them. I don't know. Something that's not going to go well. Um, but, yeah, no, I think you kind of said it yourself. It, it, it's health versus depth. And HP really, really hit it on the head there. It's health versus depth. And 
you know, obviously Tampa is going to continue to remain as deep as they can be. I think the only deeper teams you got here, probably, well, the only deeper teams you really have are in the West anyway, with, you know, Colorado and Vegas and such. But even that, even both of those teams aren't looking as good as they should be right now either. <laughs> it's amazing that with the picks that Tampa Bay has traded away over the past few years to stockpile assets and build that depth, Excuse me. You know, they, they move those picks when they're going all in for a cup, and yet they still have one of the deepest prospect pools in the league. They can run four lines, you know, on a nightly basis, and, and any line can step up and be the heroes. I'm, I'm looking at the box score of this Tampa Bay game tonight. Goal scorers are Braden Point, Andre Palat, and Ryan McDonough. So when you're getting goals out of your defense, uh, you know, anytime you're able to do that, that's a good thing. That name, that list of names you just said too, like that just proves the depth that they have. Right. And you, you mentioned is out. Stamkos doesn't have a point tonight, but Stamkos has finally fallen off. But he's still there. Well, he Captain, hasn't, he's still though. that voice. He hasn't though. He's got ten points on the season. If ten points through five games, that's it, pretty good. He's, he's getting it done early and stepping up with uh, with Kucherov out. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's funny too. You mentioned the draft picks and stuff. I mean, Hey, you got to give it to their scouts, man. Like, like, you know, Braden point like, here, here, here's a, here's a trivia question. Do not Google it. You have five okay. seconds to answer this. Okay. What number overall was Braden point drafted and bonus points. If you guess what year? Uh, well, I, I do actually know this. Uh, he was a third round pick. I want to say, oh, I want to say he was, late 80s early 90s overall because the minnesota wild had the pick that was used to select braden point and they traded down one spot tampa bay takes braden point and the wild drafted louis belpedio who in that spot yep exactly <laughs> no uh, Bel belpedio is good but i think his ceiling is as a career ahl or you know he's, he's nowhere near braden point right it to just where it's at. So thank you for bringing that up and reminding me that the wild oh. could have had Braden point and had the first line, you know, true number one center. That the organization has lacked for most of the entirety of their franchise. So thanks for that. You are welcome. And to, and uh, your answer, it was the 2014 or 2014 draft and he was 79th overall. 79th. Okay. But even still, I, I knew it was somebody... somewhere in late seventies, early eighties, something like that. Somebody that good, 79th well, overall, your scouts are doing their job. <laughs> we're going to try something a little new here on the show, and we're going to take a look at a couple of games that are coming up later this week. And in fact, both of these are games that are tomorrow, and taking a look at the uh, the odds on these two games and offering our take on a pick. Boston Bruins plus 110 at Florida Panthers minus 130. Panthers undefeated. Boston is 3-1 and one on the season. Joel, give me your pick on that game. Who you got between Boston and Florida? Florida all the way. I hate that I'm going to do this, but I'm going to go Boston. I I can see why you would do that. I mean, if there's going to be a team to play spoiler to one of the you know few remaining undefeated teams, I could see Boston doing it. Um, I don't know, man. I think you know Florida's on a heater, and I think they're going to max you know they're going to maximize it. And also, Boston's a good team, but they've escaped you know maybe one or two of their games perhaps i i think the big thing with florida is going to be what they do with quenville and oh i agree but that, we're that not going to know by tomorrow could be so a factor right we, we won't know that tonight we'll probably find out more tomorrow what florida ultimately decides to do um but i think that's going to be just such a distraction hanging either way the uncertainty of it uh could be a factor and don't get me like florida was my pick i made it on the show two weeks ago oh, yeah. florida is going to win the cup this year that's my pick yeah um and and i'm riding with them the whole way but i think for tomorrow that could be trouble i agree no i i definitely agree and i i can see it i i think i just think i i gotta ride the hot hand if i'm if i'm putting money on this one all right and second one Vegas Golden Knights minus 115 at Dallas Stars minus 105. Those are some surprisingly close odds given where Vegas and Dallas have been over the last couple of years. But Vegas struggling to begin the season. Uh, no Alex Tuck, no Max, Pat, uh, Max Pacioretty, no Mark Stone. Martinez is hurt. 
Zach Whitecloud is hurt. But then you look at Dallas. They're down Jason Robertson. He called a runner-up last season. And Dallas can't score right now. Joel, who are you taking in this one? You know what? Smart money. Probably Dallas. All you need to do is look at the standings and see, you know, Dallas, they can't score right now, but they are still three and three. They're sitting, you know, in that third seed in the in the central right now. And they can't score, but <laughs> you just named it, man. Look at Vegas' decimation of injuries. They have virtually nobody there on a the fact that Vegas sits at one and four with a minus nine goal differential, which is very interesting with that defense that they have. Um I, th- I still think, and you know, I, it was kind of my pick too. You know, I have Vegas at least making the Western Conference final again, but they need to get their stuff together here. I don't know if it happens tomorrow night, though. You know what? I'm going to take Vegas here just to be different. But wow. holy smokes, is Braden Holt me off to a great start in I Dallas know. after how bad he's been. His last year with the Capitals, last season with Vancouver, he, he was putting up terrible numbers. And this year he's got a goals against below two and a save percentage over 930. I mean, he's he's feeling it right now and, and playing well. But something about Vegas, man. I mean, they're Vegas has had a difficult schedule out of the out of the gates here. And I mean, they opened the season at home. Uh, you know, hosting the Seattle Kraken. Um, but since then, at the Kings, which was a, just a weird, fluky game, that was a 6-2 loss. A loss 3-1 against the St. Louis Blues, undefeated. A loss me. against the Edmonton Oilers, who are undefeated. Yep. And I uh, shut out loss 2-0 against the New York Islanders, who are one of the top defensive teams in the league. Sorokin with back-to-back shutouts in net. Like, that's a good Islanders team, and that's kind of a tough gamut to run. And even right now, you know, Vegas is playing Colorado. It's 2 nothing Vegas at the end of the first. So Vegas is still a good team here, and they've just had a tough go of it. I think I'm going to go Vegas here. Oh, absolutely. And I think uh, you mentioned you're picking Vegas to be different. I actually picked Dallas to be different. I think the, the, the smartest, the smarter play is to go Vegas. But I think if you're from a betting perspective, you know, I could see that. Yeah. From a betting perspective, when it's, you know, I, I think, you know, we it's supposed to say plus 105, right? But like, nope. no, it is. Oh, no, it's, oh, it's minus. Oh. It is minus 105. It's it's that close right now. On the, so that would mean on the lines. That's they're the borderline, game. borderline, even money. Vegas is still the favorite, but that's what I thought. Okay. But, so. You know, that's I guess yeah. yeah, that's because so I guess because the next way that line would shift would be both would be minus one ten, and then you're looking even money. That's fair. Even still, though, I think you know from a from the money perspective, you know, if you're going to take the the quote unquote dog, this is probably the dog to take just because of the timing of it all. All right, and one last question for tonight. This one not a betting pick. This one just looking into the crystal ball. Putting on your fortune telling hat, you know, Magic Eight Ball, give it a shake, see what you think. Who is going to be the last unbeaten team to fall? There's four left: the Blues, the Hurricanes, the Oilers, and the Panthers. I don't believe any of them are playing tonight. Let me check that real quick. Um, the yeah, no, none of the, none of the undefeated teams are playing tonight. So with those four, Blues, Hurricanes, Oilers, Panthers, which of those teams will be the last of the unbeatens? Man, that is tough. Because there's so many different factors going into each of those. We have the Panthers, you know, with whatever happens with Q, right? Mm. Um, That could definitely put a damper on keeping your undefeated season alive. We have the Oil. I I would say the Oilers are up there for me to, to be one of the last ones remaining, but will their defense continue to hold up and will their goaltending continue to, to hold up long term? I think it will, but, but to remain undefeated, it's, it's tough to say. Um, the hurricanes are on a heater. Um, they're going off and you know what, as much as it kills me deep inside to say, I think the blues are going to be the, 
the last one standing here for for undefeated teams. I don't think it's going to be too much further ahead of, in my opinion, the Oilers. Um, I, I think it's going to be kind of a neck and neck between the Oilers and the Blues. Um, Oilers strictly because of the scoring. I mean, they're they're doing what Toronto clearly can't do correctly, and that's not have as much defense, but our scoring is making up for it, so it's cool. Um, I, the Blues, I mean, Jordan Bennington is Jordan Bennington. I have him in both of my fantasy leagues. Uh, he's he's a star. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna win the Vesna at some point here in the next couple of years. I'm thinking. Okay, that's a that's a bold take. I'm gonna not write this, that. No, 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 not this, year, no, not this year. Well, even within the next it, couple of years, I don't know if he's quite to that level yet. To not yet, I think you'll see him be there, at least in that conversation in the next maybe. couple of years. But right, let uh, me let me throw this at you next blues. next four games here and see if this this changes your mind for the Panthers. Uh, tomorrow at or uh, hosting Boston rather. Yep. Friday at Detroit. Saturday at Boston, and then they're off until the following Thursday against Washington, and potentially five games down the road, you could have unbeaten Florida, unbeaten Carolina. Oh, um, okay. looking at the Hurricanes, their next five: Boston, Chicago, Arizona, Chicago, Florida. Well, uh, you, know, you know they got two victories against us there. <laughs> uh, St. Louis, uh, home against. Colorado, then Chicago, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Anaheim, and then Edmonton, home against Philly, road against Vancouver, home against Seattle, home against Nashville, home against the Rangers. I think you just proved my point a little bit. It sounds like the Blues and the Oilers have the easiest path. (laughs) All right, I'm going to go... I'm gonna go Oilers. You you went Blues. I'm gonna go Oilers. There, I I think those really are kind of the two, and that's not to say that those are necessarily the two best teams of that bunch. I think the Panthers and Hurricanes are better teams than the Blues and the Oilers, um, but at least for the sake of this unbeaten streak to begin the season, it's a little more favorable schedule wise for um, for the Blues and the Oilers here. Um, Blues, I think, are going to end up finishing third in the central division. I do think Colorado is going to bounce back. Um, I think it's going to be a, a dog fight with Dallas and Minnesota in there as well. Blues. I could see falling off a little bit, but they're playing really, really great hockey to start the season. Oh yeah. And Edmonton, Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl are just so good at hockey. <laughs> like it's honestly unfair. <laughs> it's true. I mean, that's, that's kind of why it's like, how do, how do you beat that? I mean, obviously you got to have sound defense to beat that, but even then they're still too good. <laughs> they still figure out a way. All righty. Joel, you are no longer in school. I am no longer in school. We graduated already, but I am going to give you some homework here. Oh, and this boy. comes courtesy of our, it might as well be our, our third host of the show today. And that's Joey. <laughs> Joey yeah. has a spicy take that he wants to yeah. share with us. And this is, We're not going to have time to get into it tonight, but this is something that is going to be a point of conversation at some point on this show in the near future. Spicy take. Mike Madano, better than Patrick Kane for best American-born player. All-around player versus a guy who never plays defense. Joey, you have no idea how happy it makes me to see Joel's brain firing so fast to come up with an angry yet nuanced response to that take. I I agree. And Joel and I have had this conversation before. I'm I'm a Madonna guy and Joel is is a caner. I mean it, it just is. That's that's where he's at with it. It's his, it's his hometown team. He's gotta go with Caner, but we are absolutely going to get into that at some point on this I show like in it. the near future. Uh, but Joey, we did want to give you one more shout out and one more thank you. Uh, for all of your help thank with you the show tonight. In, man. Um, that is it for our show. Thank you so much for joining us here on Pod Snipe Selly, uh, brought to you by the Sports 2.0 Network and Noop Sports. Uh, they've been so helpful to us in getting this uh, this podcast off the ground. Um, thank you to RJ for all your work on our, uh, our videos for the week. Uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll be back next Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, for more of our content Eastern. here. 
Yep. Eight o'clock Eastern. Don't forget our like, central okay, time, buddy. Okay. Seven Central. <laughs> I'll make sure to say. Yeah. Come on now. Eight, eight o'clock Eastern. Seven Central. Eastern time, people. Um, find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitch. Uh, you can also listen on demand on Spotify and on any uh, iTunes platform, Apple Podcasts, however you want to listen that way. For Joel Fernino, I am Dan Bradley. Enjoy the rest of your night, everybody.